It is a great honor to me to welcome you at the graduate students workshops of one of the most important world philosophers today, Alain Badiou, who certainly, at least among all of you, I suppose, does not need any further introduction. Uh, we are organizing those three events in the New York area. I mean, today's workshop on being an event. On Wednesday, as you probably already know, there will be Alain Badiou's lecture on his soon-to-be-published Demonance of Truth at Princeton University, preceded by a short talk by Kenneth Reinhardt, uh, whom we have over here, who's along with um, Susan Spitzer, one of the translators of this book. And finally, on Thursday, there will be a second graduate workshop on the logics of worlds that will take also place at the Princeton University. These events are a part of an effort to, ha to honor Alain Badiou's philosophical oeuvre, which in the context of contemporary continental philosophy has no comparison. Although Alain Badiou has been a frequent guest at North American universities, he rarely had an occasion to speak directly about his ontological system, to speak philosophy as such, without passing through its other procedures, such as science, love, politics, or art. The ambition of these three events is to fill, in some sense, this unfillable lack, if I was to to, to, to use this Lacanian words, and to help to open up for, for the new reception of Alain Badiou's philosophy within the United States. I would like to at first thank all my, to thank all my colleagues without whose dedicated work these e events would never be possible. To Nick Nesbitt, professor of French and Italian at Princeton University, as well as to my colleagues from the Graduate Student Committee, Lea Byers, Nicolas Cognon, who are both PhD student, students in art history, and Hélène Quignou, PhD student in anthropology, who unfortunately fell sick today. Uh, I would like to also express our gratitude to all the institutions that have generously provided support for these workshops. For Columbia University, I would like to thank the Columbia University Graduate School of Arts and Sciences, the Institute for Comparative Literature and Society, the Heyman Center for Humanities, the Temple Hoyne Buell Center for the Study of American Architecture, the Department of Art History and Archaeology, and the Department of French and Romance Philology. I would also like to express our gratitude to the Princeton University, namely to the Department of French and Italian, for joining the, their forces with Columbia to make this even happen. Of course, I would like to also thank Alain Badiou for joining us today, as well as to Kenneth Reinhardt, coming here from LA, who is an Associate Professor and Director of Graduate Studies at the UCLA, as well as to other Columbia faculty members who came to take part in today's discussion. Uh, we have here in the room Etienne Balibar, the Visiting Professor at the French Department, and Bruno Bostils, who is a Professor at the Latin American Department uh, uh, of Columbia, and finally Mary MacLeod, somewhere hidden there in the room, a professor architecture department. <laughs> um, finally, I would like to thank all of you participants of this workshop. I know that some of you have been studying Alain Badiou's work for years and traveled from places all around the globe only to attend this workshop. There are people coming from Canada, Brazil, Ireland, or from various American states. It is among all your enthusiasm and your fidelity to Alain Badiou's work that will be shaping our discussions during those three days. So please do not be shy and do not hesi hesitate to ask any intriguing questions. <laughs> so just to start our discussion, I would like to start today with a short recapitulation of some of the key points that appeared within the excerpts of being a, an event that we have assigned you as readings for today, today's workshop, assuming, obviously, that you all had time to read and to go, go through those readings, and that I will be only repeating some of the more obvious stuff here. But obviously, I would say, uh, regarding the organization of this workshop, I'll do this very short introduction, which will be really just telegraphic, to just to remind us a few points. Uh, then maybe we could present ourselves very quickly, then Alain Badiou will do a very short, like, short talk. 
and then we dedicate the second half of this workshop to only discussing the readings point by point, so you'll have time to ask questions regarding to what you have read, and maybe go even farther if you would like. Mm. So obviously, although it is extremely difficult to separate only a few chapters from the entire architecture of this incredibly complex book, we try to select chapters that may cover the most basic principles of Alain Badiou's philosophy. The introduction to being an event delineates Alain, Alain Badiou's general philosophical project by positing that mathematics is ontology, or in other words, it is a discourse on being. Mathematics writes that which of being itself is pronounceable in the field of a pure theory of the multiple. Yet, accepting a thesis that mathematics is a discourse on being also necessarily means for Alain Badiou that philosophy cannot be centered on ontology. In other, world, in other words, philosophy circulates between this ontology, qua mathematics, and the modern theories of the subject and its own history. Philosophy asks questions such as, if pure mathematics is the science of being, how is a subject or an event even possible? Thus, by proposing a meta-ontological thesis that mathematics is the historicity of the discourse on being qua being, Badiou insists that philosophy shall, among all, fo focus on the concepts of the event, or in other words, that what, what is not being qua being, on the concepts of truth and of the subject. The meditations one and three that we have assigned you focus on disentangling the dialectics between the one and the multiple, a dialectics that constitutes the foundation of the philosophical discourse as such. It is with the questions of the one and the multiple that philosophy begins in the famous poem of Parmenides, as well as in Plato's attempts to refute Parmenides in the dialogues such as the Sophists or Parmenides. So it is only logic that by starting being an event, Badiou has to treat those questions. In these chapters, Badiou posits that the one exists only as operation, as the so-called count as one, and that the being is composed of inconsistent multiplicities, or in other words, of multiplicities of multiplicities without the one. Thus, he alludes to the statement already present in the late Jacques Lacan's work in the form of his famous quip, Il y a de l'un, or in other words, for Lacan, there's a difference between the positivity of the existence of the one and its existence only as a result of the count in this Il y a de l'un, or there is one. So it's a, there's a difference between one that exists and there is one as a result of the count. The meditation seven and eight explain the difference between the concepts of belonging and inclusion, which are indeed crucial to understanding by this concept of the event that appear in later chapters. While belonging is in Badiou's words, when a multiple is counted as element in the presentation of another multiple, and thus uh, this concept relates to the category of presentation, inclusion is when a multiple is a sub-multiple of another multiple, when it is counted as one by the state of the situation and relates to the category of representation. It is the fact that there is no totality, no total multiple, that would be able to include everything that belongs to it, and that there's a, indeed a disjunction between belonging and inclusion that later enables Alain Badiou to propose the matim of the event in the Meditation 17. And again, if you want to, as you probably noticed in reading this, this very like, uh, easy summarizing um, table on the page 102 in the English translation, where you have uh, those concepts of belonging and inclusion uh, quite simply portrayed. The meditation 23 that we assign is quite beautiful for the ethical considerations that it depicts it shows how the subject is shaped by his or her fidelity to the event. A subject is, according to Badiou, the process of liaison between the event or the intervention and the procedure of fidelity, the connection. According to Alain Badiou, subjectivity is always supported by fidelity. It is a local incorporation of an infinite truth procedure. 
The Meditation 31 is a key chapter for understanding Badiou's conceptual apparatus. It proves the existence of the infinite truth and mentions his famous four generic truth procedures, or in other words, the conditions of philosophy, art, love, science, and politics. It also reminds us that philosophy does not generate truths. It is conditioned by them. There are no philosophical truths as such, and this is very important for this. This is something that people are generally kind of confused about. Uh, this meditation also establishes some key distinctions that between the knowledge, which is the capacity to discern multiples within the situation which possess this or that property, and whose key tools are discernment and classification, and militant inquiries, which resemble knowledge except that they identify what is indiscernible from the point of view of the encyclopedia of knowledge, and decide about its connection or non-connection to the event. Here, Badiou makes also a key distinction between veridicity, which is a part of knowledge, and the infinite truth. And I think it's also by using this term inquiry, in a sense, I think one thing to which Badiou points out is the way how philosophy always goes, in a sense, beyond the academia. Because inquiry, as such, is pointing to something which is indiscernible from the point of view of the state of the situation. And I think we could say that this somehow also relates to the whole situation as philosophy as such, because for you, in a sense, uh, philosophy also sort of transgresses the dis what Lacan called the discourse of university. So um, we could uh, say that there's a, I would say we're here all within the academia, but in a sense, there's something in Alain Badiou's works that also goes beyond the academia as such. And finally, uh, I would like to briefly mention that the last meditation that we have assigned, the meditation 35, on the theory of the subject, which describes the subject as a local configuration of a generic truth procedure from which a truth is supported. While a truth is infinite, a subject which emerges in its fidelity to the event and realizes a truth is finite. A subject is like a local incorporation of infinite truths. If we were to use Plato's terms, we could say that the subject participates on a truth. By the way, Badiou himself told me once that his friend Kantameyasu described being as event as his theory of participation. So, just to say that my introduction to being an event here is really telegraphic. I have, of course, made only a very rough sketch of the key issues presented in those chapters. I was only to start our conversation with something. And um, and to remind us some of the ideas that we have already read. Um, hopefully we'll be able to discuss these issues more in detail in the second half of the workshop. Um, and now, maybe before um, uh, giving word to Alain Badiou, I would like to ask us, because obviously we went through your applications and you're all coming from far away, and we'll be seeing us, uh, each, each other for the next three days, if maybe we could make a round table so that you say like probably your name and maybe you're interested in by you, but please, because there are so many of us, so don't say more than one sentence. <laughs> be really uh, be really telegraphic. And so I'm I'm Nick Nesbitt. Yeah. Uh, glad to see everyone and so glad we could and thanks to Jana above all uh, for, for helping to organize this and, and Putting it together, uh, I'm in the Department of French and Italian at Princeton, and uh, looking forward to these uh, three days together. I'm uh, Corey from <coughs> Corey McDonald from Tufts University, English department, um, and I'm kind of trying to figure out within the Jews ontology what the relationship or what possible relationship exists between artistic and political truth procedures. Uh, I'm Cody, I'm a double PhD student in comparative literature and religion from the University of Chicago. Uh, I'm, I'm sort of interested in uh, the concept of speculation in art and literature in the present moment. Um, uh, sorry, if I could just say, uh, if we can all speak clearly and <coughs> loudly, that'll be a help for, for everyone. Uh, my name is Reza Mediri, uh, and I am a PhD student uh, under supervision of Professor Badiou, uh, my dissertation uh, is on uh, infinity and the subject, uh, the relationship, and uh, the work that I've done on Badiou is 
to show that there are uh, fundamental questions in the entire oeuvre that uh, runs from 1960 to present time. Uh, so um, it uh, renders uh, uh, an attention, and I call it a discipline, a um, theory of discipline, but uh, this is something to be seen what the feedback will be. Uh. <laughs> um, my name is Blake Shaw. Um, I'm doing my uh, dissertation at EGS under Boris Royce. Um, I've been studying Batu for three or four years now, focusing on uh, a lot of the mathematics, and what I've been focusing on recently is trying to um, work through the existential analysis of the object that, um, uh, and the method that Badu employs there uh, at the first in the first part of uh, at, in the scolium to the um, second book of the greater logic. Um, so I've been trying to wrap my head around sheets. My name is Christian Khan. I'm a third year PhD student in anthropology at the I've been mostly interested in is the new political truth. Uh, I'm Adam Klein. Um, I'm a master's student at the U School. Um, and I've been interested in Badu for three or four years. Um, I'm very interested in French structuralism and the tools of structural analysis and how one can conjugate axiomatic thinking with uh, elements of experience like the mystical or um, love. Uh, my name is Christopher Walter. I'm also at EGS under uh, Zupanchik and Delar, and uh, I primarily work on Badu's theory of theater. My name is Parish, and I've been reading uh, a lot of interviews for the last five years, and it's been really important for me to kind of thinking past the impasse of Stalinism and Maoism that still structures revolutionary politics and theory. <coughs> My name is Disha. I'm a second year PhD student in the Department of History at Princeton. I work on the history of anti imperialism, particularly in the 1920s and 30s. Um, and I've started to turn more toward uh, the tools of intellectual history to help me understand that, and in so doing, I'm thinking about subject formation uh, and revolution. So that's my opinion. I'm John Kaplan. I'm also at Princeton. And I would say my interest is in how um, certain historical events like revolutions and catastrophes come to significance. Uh, I'm Bruno Steels. I'm an old friend from of uh, Alain Badu's, also a translator and I've written uh, uh, you know, some stuff on, on Badu. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Ken Reinhardt. I teach at UCLA in Complement English and I run the program in Experimental Critical Theory there and I've uh, written on uh, and translated written introductions for Badu's books. I am Alain Badu. And I am very, very interested to hear something concerning Alain Badu. Certainly, I don't know profoundly Alain Badu. My name is Nick Krogan. I'm a graduate student in art history at Columbia. Um, I think um, Badu's work is not so well known as it should be in art history, um, and I think he has a lot to offer our understandings of both art and history. Hi, I'm Leia. I'm also a PhD student in the art history department here at Columbia, and I'm particularly interested in the question of the subject and subjectivity in Badu's work. Hello, my name is Ashraf Abdallah. I'm a fourth year PhD student of architecture here at Columbia. Uh, I have to say, uh, I don't come from a philosophical background, and I know very little about the work of uh, Alain Badiou, and I would like to know more uh, specifically, but, you know, from the little I read, you know, I came across categories that we don't usually hear in academia, specific in architecture department, like being and event and universal categories, so I'm, I'm excited to know more about that. My name is uh, Oscar. I'm a third year uh, PhD student in architecture here at Columbia University. I do work on modern architecture and universalism, and I suppose I would be interested in hearing how architecture could be uh, a generic, generic procedure or participate in one. And I'm also, you know, fellow student of Yama's and just interested in uh, understanding what she's been talking about for, for our first few years. <laughs> My name is Norma Hussey. I'm from Ireland. 
I'm not an academic, but I have been reading about you for uh, nine years. Um, I am, I'm particularly interested in the crossings between love and politics, and I, I do have one particular question with regard to the chapter on the generic and why it is that you think philosophy is less, less of an aid to that procedure than to the other procedures. My name is Moises Ramirez, uh, MA student at New School and UBS, uh, trying to devise a system of imprisons, a term whose origin is attributed to Alain Badu. Uh, and basically the question is, is there a space between presence and absence? I'm Shah Piai, yeah, I'm, I'm an artist, so I'm, I'm a friend of Anna. So I, I want to just come here to look here. <laughs> I'm joking, so I'm here. Uh, I'm Alexander Miller. I'm in comparative literature at NYU. Um, and I've been largely focused on Lacan, um, and I'm interested in psychoanalysis as a form of dialectical materialism. Hi, I'm Kathleen Evanson. I'm in the Latin American and Iberian Cultures program, and I work on sabotage and the figure of the saboteur from 19th century till today, and I'm interested in this question of fidelity and militancy. Um, my name is Sarah, I'm both working PhD students in Middle Eastern and South Asian African Studies. Um, I've been reading a little bit here since I was an undergraduate, and I would say I primarily had a political entry point or introduction to your work. And uh, uh, today I read it somewhat differently because I'm interested in the theories of imminence. I work today mostly in political ecology and questions of the history of science and the philosophy of science. And so, um, one of the things I, I stuck with is your theory of eminence and the question of objectification and um, also generally interested in what what your, what your system of ontology has to say today about the possibilities of truth, the possibilities of veridiction, um, uh, interested in putting your work in dialogue with contemporary object-oriented intelligence but generally in seeing how that travels or doesn't. So, um, I'm Mary McLeod, I'm a teacher of Yana's, and I'm here to learn. <laughs> I'm Chad, I'm a seventh year at Princeton. I work on the history of French anti-humanism, both modern and early modern, perhaps especially early modern. And I'm interested in Bedu's theory of the subject, and how it is at once perhaps, perhaps a post-locating theory, but also somehow returns to pre structures uh, My name is Mark, and I'm uh, graduate student in music theory here at Columbia. I look at phenomenological approaches to the study of music and in particular interested in its ability to affect our perception of time and space. So very interested in
Okay, thank you very much. Again, I just want to, during all this workshop, I want to say how important it is for you to speak very loud because so that Alam can hear. Okay, obviously helping to translate. You know, they're speaking, uh, yeah. when you speak in English, I don't understand anything. Yeah. <laughs> so it's really like, you um, have to speak very loud. Um, but uh, sometimes my interpretation of what you are saying <laughs> is better than you are saying. <laughs> But completely false. <laughs> so, it's, it, in some sense, it's uh, really difficult for me to, to speak about uh, being an event. And uh, probably you have to this book, Mirror of Worship Sheep, as I Because for me, it's. Uh, it's an old book. <laughs> it's a book of uh, the part of uh, my youth. And also, and I return to this point, uh, a part of uh, something what is the correct name? Something melancholy. <laughs> Some, 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 some descriptive parts. The being an event has been written between 1982, when the theory of the subject is published, the same year when the theory of the subject is published. So between 1982 and 1987. Five years, five years to write. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it has been uh, written <coughs> for logic of the world. They have uh, 13 years to write the book. And uh, for the remanence of truth, approximately 12 years. So we we just observe that the big event is something like a, like a quick improvisation, not exactly a, a complex result of a long meditation. In fact. The material of this book was read before uh, uh, I read it. And it was composed of some uh, materials very different and sometimes very old for me. <coughs> like about uh, 61. <coughs> the, the, the mathematical material was in fact uh, something of my uh, studies before May 68, before also, before my new life, if you want. Theory of sets and uh, its uh, new center during the 60s, the theory of generic sets and forcing by Paul Cohen. All that was in my mind. Uh, it, 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 in my mind from a long time, maybe 20 years. The purely philosophical material, you can find in some sense in the seminar of the 80s, which, which had been published in general. Family Des, uh, Heidegger, Malbron, Hegel, Aristotle, Kant, and also Leibniz, and some others. A sequence of my life where I studied seriously philosophy. <laughs> and uh, seriously means across history of philosophy. <laughs> 
académic star. The poetical material go back to the 60s too. Who is uh, my uh, seminars concerning Malarmé, Rago, Olderly? So you see, philosophy, classical philosophy, if you want, antipathical material and literature, poetical material, all that go back to the 60s or to the 70s and was ready for the manipulation. <laughs> the question was politics. <clears throat> Because the political material has a complex history, theory of subject, in some sense, which is published in 19. 82 is a sort of intellectual witness of the 70s. Or maybe an intellectual witness of the sequence of 10 years from May uh, 68 uh, to the 80s, something like that. What I named the uh, 10 red years. <laughs> Ten years, which have been for me, ten years of purely activist. And so, in some sense, the the subject is a philosophical witness of this purely activist life. But when you become the witness of your life, it is that your life is finished. So we call was also something like the end of the sequence, a witness of the end of the, of the sequence. My idea was to continue uh, the theory of the subject at the beginning, at the very beginning of the, the writing of being. My idea was to continue and uh, In the primitive version, in the first uh, uh, writing, we have for all parts four dimensions and not three. We have mathematics, we have concepts, and we have history of philosophy. But in the first version, we have also politics. And so we have a, a sort of a global organization around four forms of presentation of ideas. But finally, I have suppressed politics. And it's a, in my opinion, it's an important point to understand some aspects of the uh, Why have suppressed politics? <coughs> I don't know really. It's unclear. I have said, oh, it's not too good. <coughs> I have said all the art in theory of the subject. I cannot repeat it and so on. But I think it was in my subjectivity the birth of the conviction, the negative conviction, perhaps. That the 80s, 1982, and the 80s was really the end of the revolutionary sequence. The end of the, the revolutionary movements in the world, the 10 years, and the beginning of a completely new sequence the political level, which for me was a sequence of counter-revolution. And I think that we are in two today. So, from near 40 years. So all that in, in the vision of uh, my life, in some sense, with uh, a new beginning, uh, 
at the end of the 60s, and something new at the beginning of the 80s. And the books, my books, my philosophy books, are placed in the sense of construct inside uh, that sort of uh, political and historical vision. I think it is why ontology was so important. Ontology was, in some sense, the return of the classical vision of philosophical questions, not immediately under the political condition. It was like a reflexive stopping place in my subjective transformation by politics and history. I have been transformed, I have often explained this point, I have been profoundly transformed by May 68 and the political issue. And uh, being an event is a sort of stopping place of that sort of subjective transformation. And it's the point of melancholy. The point of melancholy, certainly. <coughs> So the book is a, the book is, is quiet, is calm, <coughs> it's a solid construction, not for red circumstances, but for eternity, because eternity is always the moment where history is in some sense without any interest. <coughs> And so, uh, and so I, I read today being an event as the beginning of a sequence which for myself is politically negative. And so for me, uh, the book is also something like a therapeutic virtue. Therapeutic virtue uh, to accept the end of uh, the new life. After that, if history or politics don't propose a new life, we, we must, in some sense, accept the new sequence. If you refuse absolutely, we are in a nihilistic vision, which is a possibility, but not mine. <laughs> and if you are not in nihilistic consequences, uh, the, the end of the new life, you must construct uh, a new place, a new place. And in some sense, uh, being an event is the construction of this new place for thinking. With inside the new place, the memory of the past, which is concentrated under the concept of event. So being and event is like uh, a new house <coughs> when uh, the new life is finished, to resist in some sense to continue, to continue to think, with, in a conceptual form, a memory of uh, the past, the red past, the new past, and the fundamental concept, which is like a synthesis of Mozart, which is the concept of Italy. So, being, it's the stopping place. An event is the memory of the great years. The, my subjective interpretation of the book <coughs> is what I read myself.
So after that, some uh, more technical remarks concerning the Naturally, uh, we are now after that, me, at the level of ontology, we have a strong theoretical decision, a strong philosophical decision. First, I decide that ontology, that is the whole form of thinking about being quali, about being as such, that ontology exists, is a possibility. We can organize the knowledge of all the possible forms of being as such. At this level, we have a complex discussion with Heidegger. I don't go to the details, but Heidegger is important in being an from the very beginning of the book. Because Heidegger was, in some sense, the return to thinking of being as such in the history of philosophy after positivism, uh, Kantian critique, and so on and so on. It's a, it's a form of a return to, for Heidegger, a form of origin, finally, before Plato. <laughs> so there is, there is a moment of return in Heidegger, and in some sense it's also, I explained that before, it's also for me a form of return to And so uh, we have a, a complex discussion uh, with uh, Heidegger. And we, we, we can find the details of uh, this discussion in some seminars too. And first of all, the seminar about Heidegger. <laughs> this is the first point. But the second decision is to affirm that ontology is a science. You know, there is a big tradition which, is, which opposes precisely ontology to science. In some sense, it's a possible interpretation of Kant, the Kantian critic, concerning the the thing it itself, uh, le soi, and so on, we cannot have any knowledge, any true knowledge. So the science and uh, the possibility to know uh, being as such are completely uh, different. So uh, I decided to affirm that ontology is a science, and not only a science, but the oldest science, mathematics. And, and this point for me is, uh, is another dimension of my uh, thinking, I think for myself, which is, uh, which is to be a classic. I am a classic. <coughs> this is why I, I don't uh, appreciate when somebody says that I am a postmodern. <laughs> I hate post-modernity <laughs> because I am a classic. <laughs> that is, in some sense, uh, before to be a modern, not postmodern, but no modern at all. But a classic. <laughs> and classic in the return to the idea that ontology is a science. I think that you find in Aristotle, the book Gamma of Metaphysics, where Aristotle says there exists the science of the person. <coughs> but the difference is that I identify a sort of science, this formal science, that is. The 
tout ça pour une concernant cette décision, cette fondamentale décision de la vie et de cette purely philosophical discussion concerning ontology is for me uh, without any interest the fight against classical metaphysics, the criticism of Kant, the, posit the positivism, the poetical attempt of Heidegger. All that for me is outside the question at the end. Because the answer to the question is very simple. We know, in fact, from the Greek, many things concerning the search in the form, in the historical form of mathematics. So, and to resume all that, which is the fundamental direction of the work, I propose something like a philosophical proof, proof in the philosophical sense of what is a proof. I propose a philosophical proof of the fact that ontology is not a philosophical question. That is, yes, that is a torsion, something complex. To have the ambition to propose a proof that the, that the classical philosophical question is precisely not a philosophical question. And it gives this proof that I define ontology as the science of uh, multiplicities. Multiplicities without the one. And we return here to a uh, second big discussion with Heidegger. Because Heidegger also says that uh, the enemy of uh, the true thinking of being is the one. He says that uh, from Plato to today, the, the one have sized and corrupt the true thinking of being. And I agree with Heidegger on this point. But the proposition of Heidegger is, uh, in some sense, uh, weaker than the position of the critics. <coughs> that is, finally, uh, the question of being as such is uh, eternally a question with uh, no real answer, no real proposition. So at the same point, when I say that ontology is fundamentally thinking of pure multiplicities, without the one, I agree with Heidegger in some sense, but the conclusion is to be opposed to Heidegger. At this point, with all this uh, form of decision, we have something uh, strange, which is that philosophy is, in some sense, the meta-mathematics much more than the metaphysics. <coughs> it's not a metaphysic. So it's not something which comes after the knowledge of the real world. Not at all. It's a pure study of possible forms of being as such. And so something like a meta-mathematics, where you prove that <coughs> mathematics is the only possible thinking of uh, being as such. And so it's a philosophical theory made with and inside a purely mathematical theory. Precisely, the theory of sense. And it is why all the beginning of uh, being an event is uh, made of uh, commentaries of uh, the axiom 
Donc, le système de Jérôme Sainz. Oui, je pense que tu peux dire différence entre l'inclusion et l'élémentaire et so on. Et donc, il constitue d'ailleurs, in my opinion, une nouvelle relation de fille between philosophy and mathematics, because it's a point where, for me, mathematics says something, which I mean, mean as such, without knowing that that is the sense of mathematics. Because mathematicians, when you say to mathematicians, okay, you, your business is ontology, they say, well, Maybe, why not? Sometimes they are very happy because it's important. But generally they are absolutely skeptical. But it's, it's not my problem. Because in fact, it's not inside mathematics that we know that mathematics is ontology. It's a philosophical sentence, not a mathematical one. And so, uh, This is what I name the strange relationship between philosophy and mathematics, which is that I say concerning mathematics <coughs> something which is not really uh, possible to say from inside mathematics itself. And uh, uh, all that induces a complex discussion, not only uh, with Heidegger, naturally, but also uh, with uh, Classical rationalism. Because in classical rationalism, mathematics is not at all ontology or something like that. Mathematics is a formal model of what is a proof. For example, if you take Spinoza, for Spinoza, mathematics is fundamental, then Spinoza says that without mathematics, uh, humanity will uh, completely ignore. So mathematics is important, but not at all in the sense of mathematics itself is saying what is being asserted. The being asserted is substance, God, and so on. But the form of uh, philosophy must be near the mathematical demonstration. And it was also the case in Leibniz or in the principle of Descartes and so on. So, And in my conclusion, point, you have finally three possible relationships between mathematics and philosophy. The first one is that there is no relation at all. In fact, it's the ordinary position. Okay, mathematics are something very interesting and so on. Philosophy is the core of uh, phenomenology, theory of consciousness, uh, uh, theory of patience, and so on and so on, have no real relationship to mathematics as such. The first position. The second position is uh, that uh, uh, philosophy has a real relationship to mathematics concerning a sort of epistemological point, which is the proposition of a new model, a new form of what is really rationality in the field of philosophy. So there is a fascination for mathematics, but an external fascination. You are not inside mathematics, but you see mathematics as something which is able to give absolute proofs. And after that, uh, uh, in uh, classical metaphysics, we have attempted to give, for example, of the existence of God, a proof which is as a good proof than the mathematical proof. Generally a failure. Generally a failure. But it has been great desire of all parts of classical metaphysics. And the third, uh, uh, what I propose is to say that, uh, in fact, mathematics was, without 
no way. He, one of the most important questions of philosophy itself, still on the road. And so we maintain that the mathematics is different from philosophy, but in some sense, uh, at the price that uh, fundamental part of uh, all philosophy is mathematics itself. And philosophy must uh, have only reflection on this point. Philosophy says that mathematics is ontology. A possible false interpretation, what is, which is interpretation of some of our mathematical friends, as René Guitard, for example, is that mathematics is purely and simply a part of it. Precisely, sometimes the logical part of philosophy sometimes the ontological part of philosophy, but the part of philosophy. All that constitutes, in some sense, uh, the fundamental background of all the book. After that, we have the way of the book. And the way is from being to truth and subject. From being to truth and subject. But, you know, and it is why the, the book is also a strange book. From being, there is a, no direct way to truth, or so kind of, <coughs> in theory of sets, so we don't find uh, something like uh, truth or something. Yeah. <coughs> so the way from being as uh, something in, inside mathematics to truth and subject, is uh, uh, some, something which is purely inside philosophy. So the beginning is outside philosophy, but the consequences of the beginning are immediately inside philosophy. And so in some sense, the movement of the book is to go from mathematics to something which has no uh, signification from a mathematical point of view. <coughs> subject, the truth, are not at all concept of uh, mathematics. And so, I must admit that on this point, there is a second uh, decision, which is not exactly the same as the first decision. To say that mathematics is ontology as the first decision concerns uh, a proof concerning mathematics. <laughs> After that, the, the movement from being to truth and subject is, uh, has no reason uh, from being as such, has no reason from uh, the study of all forms of possible <coughs> multiplicities. And so it's the point of my desire. It is your that introduce uh, something of a philosophical, like a philosophical decision in my view. Why truth is uh, my Platonism and why subject is my whole relationship to Sartre. Sartre was my philosophical use and Plato my philosophical master. So from being the truth and subject is going to mathematics, to uh, Plato and Sartre, in some sense. <coughs> For me, the existence of truth is, uh, in some sense, uh, an evidence. I never give a proof that truth exists. I 
And I think it's impossible to give some sort of proof. So the existence of truth is really largely a conviction. <laughs> It's a generality to say that something like atomistic truth exists. And the necessity of the subject, the necessity of the theory of the subject, comes in a different way, historical. Historical and political conviction too. The subject is the support of new truth. So I must explain what is the truth of the point of view of being as such. So what is the being of the truth? To be faithful to my first decision. And I must also explain the necessity of a subject inside the construction of the truth. And so, finally, the central problem of all the book is what is the ontological status, the ontological composition of truth on one side and subject on the other side. And finally, of the relationship between the two. Ah. As a brief question to Constant Bolsar, the question, the ontological question of uh, truth in being an event, because it's not exactly the same question there for me, <coughs> is what sort of multiplicity can be universal? The, 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 problem, the simple problem, what sort of multiplicity can be universal? And you, you, you understand immediately why. If, uh, uh, if uh, all what is, is in a form of pure multiplicity and we can explain mathematically what it is, the question if uh, truth is it, what sort of multiplicity can affirm something universal and not only the singularity of the multiplicity itself. And the answer, as you know, is the generic set. So I find in mathematics itself the answer to the question what sort of multiplicity uh, can be universal. And it's why uh, the discovery of Cohen is absolutely fundamental in all the Generic set. Generic set is a set which is not reducible to a property defined in the situation. So a generic set is a subset of the situation which cannot be defined as all the elements which have a property which is defined inside of the situation itself. And naturally, a generic set can be universal because it is not determined by the precise situation where it exists. So we have all the consequences, uh, opposition, discussion concerning the theory of Cohen, which is a big part of the book, and which is not always simple, <coughs> sometimes difficult, mathematically. And you can understand why it's a philosophical reason. 
how we can define uh, multiplicity, we cannot be defined. <coughs> That's the point here. Yeah. In a generic set, in some sense, a subset of the situation, we cannot be defined inside the situation by some particular property. And so, the question of the definition of the truth is the question of the definition of something which, in some sense, cannot be defined precisely. That is why it's uh, something new in the situation. And it's the status of the, the, the generic set in the disposition of the uh, And the second question, what is a subject? The answer, I don't go to the details, the answer, the general answer, is the subject is uh, the invariant point of uh, the process of the truth. If you can speak of the process of the truth, the, what I name the truth procedure, must have a concept of the unity of the process itself. You cannot speak of the process without saying what is the unity of the sort of process of truth, that is the construction of a generic set, in fact, the construction in terms of a generic set. And the answer is that I decide to name subject of a truth. this invariant inside the process itself. And so, you know, it's a point where I realize uh, the secret goal of all metaphysics, that is to find a close relationship between being, truth, and subject. Maybe it's the goal of philosophy from the beginning. <coughs> to find the possibility of uh, new, find new relationship between being, pure multiplicity, truth, that is generic set, and uh, subject, the unity of the process of the construction of the unity. But it was not the hand. Because immediately we can object, okay, but how is it possible that something like a generic set exists? Maybe you can define a generic set, but uh, without being able to say that some generic set exists. <coughs> And naturally the answer cannot be at the level of structure of existing properties, because a generic set is presently defined as a set which cannot be defined by property inside uh, as a situation. So a generic set must be the result of something external in some sense to the situation. something not which is in the situation, but something which happens in the situation. And it's the concept of event. You know, event is a opposition to save the notion of truth. Really, uh, I think that without the concept of event, we are reduced to pure knowledge, but not truth. And at this point, I return to the discussion with Heidegger. 
because the distinction between knowledge and truth we can find in our universe. But in another direction. For me, the distinction of the knowledge and truth is the distinction between a multiplicity which can be defined by the properties of the situation and a generic set we, which cannot be defined. So the generic set must, in some sense, be constructed inside the situation without being defined by the situation itself. And this uh, asking of the possibility of the truth, I name and it is. To finish, I, I, I go to the difficulties of the truth. After all, if there is no difficulty, and this talk will be relevant, I don't try to be I give you a quick layer, uh, because it's also uh, a possibility to understand some points of the uh, of the books, and uh, of the book we speak about the the logic of the world. I think uh, at a very general level, three uh, very important difficulties. In the and event, I, I name situation, that is the context of uh, what exists, the context of what is, the failure of technology. Yes. Always okay. <laughs> Did it hear over there? No. Come here. Does it work? <laughs> I think it was working before, but it's probably also fine with that. Can everybody hear? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The battery is fine. The battery is fine. The battery is low. Do you want me to get another one? defined by the property of the situation. <laughs> but uh, it's a negative event, yeah. <laughs> an event without any truth. situation, uh, uh, the context of uh, uh, truth and so on, but I define the situation only as a, as a multiplicity, as a set, without any characteristic. I think it's too general, too general, because they must exist a structure of uh, concrete situation. Cannot be reduced at it's pure ontological definition. Everything what exists is uh, multiplicity, okay, at the level of being as such. But we can we cannot name situation with complexity, knowledge, uh, uh, properties, and so on, something which is only defined as a, as a set. And so, uh, to understand completely all that, we must study the possible structure of the situation, and not only the ontology of the situation. <coughs> and it's a goal of the book Logic of the Worlds, to describe not the abstraction of the situation, but what is the world. What is the world with the internal structure of the identity and so on. So, on this point, uh, there is a real weakness of the event, or a facilitator, because it's possible, it's too, too, too near mathematics. 
uh, you, you tell you, okay, the situation is the same. But it's a, it's a, it's ontologically correct, but we cannot explain really the difficulty of the procedure of the truth procedure uh, inside the fact that we have a set. It's the structure of the situation which is opposed uh, to the process of the truth. And it is why there is always some necessity to fight to uh, construct the truth. Concerning the event, concerning the event, uh, I think that the, the weakness of, uh, of the book is that we have not a general theory of chance. Of probability. And so, the question of what is exactly possible and what is the relation between possibility and chance is not uh, clarified. On one side, I have said that in some sense, there is always something like chance in the possibility of a truth. That is uh, the support of the idea of the novelty of a truth. It's not a necessity. That is, if not that it is dead, then you are part of chance. But uh, without uh, uh, the theory of chance. And so the question of what is the truth? Thank you so much. You don't know the structure of the question, not the behavior of the object. <coughs> And so the relationship between the chance and the, a new truth must be clarified. And uh, it was possible across a more profound meditation concerning, for example, malaria. So it's a side, that sort of question is on the side of poetry, not on the side of mathematics. And uh, finally, the uh, difficulty concerning universality. We have had uh, for a long time a very important discussion with uh, Jeff Balibar concerning universality. And uh, I agree today to say that he was right in some sense. <coughs> he was right. Because <laughs> <laughs> So, because my definition of universality in being an event is in some sense purely negative. That is genericité. But genericité signifies exclusively uh, uh, that uh, it's not reducible to uh, properties in the situation. That is a negative definition. And maybe with a sort of purely negative uh, definition, we cannot have really uh, uh, the, the solution to the question of universality. It must be a pure similitude, negative similitude, and not really universality, positive universality. And it is why in immanence of truth, I present the book. I drew to a new concept of absoluteness. An affirmative concept of absoluteness. And so, the uh, universality of the truth is composed not only of uh, negative genericity, but of something else, something different that we can explain, but not you are. <laughs> which is a, a form of relationship to the new concept of the absolute. That is the three big critics, and you know uh, the, all these critics conduct to, on one side, uh, logic of the world, on the other side, immanency of truth. 
that is a final aid. Logic of the world is a new theory of singularity, singularity of the world, and not a generality of a pure set. So it's a theory of singularity, and immanence of truth is a theory of absoluteness. And so it's with theory of singularity and theory of absoluteness, and we can now relay a complete theory of creation of something universal. After that, we have uh, some uh, more technical difficulties. Those, those three difficulties were really general difficulties, some technical difficulties. In being an event, it, it is said that the, the truth procedure is infinite, but the subject is finite. It's, it's true, but it's unclear. It's unclear, but because finally, I say that the uh, subject is a part of the uh, truth procedure. But it's, it's not sufficient. Because if the subject is the unity of the truth procedure, we cannot say that, 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 that it is finite, really and simply, that it is pure part of the truth procedure. And so I think that uh, uh, we have in being an event something like a weakness concerning the infinite as such. The concept of the infinite is uh, not uh, completely exposed. And it's also the goal of immanence of truth to, uh, to propose uh, something, uh, if I can say, infinitely more subtle <laughs> <laughs> concerning it. In it. <laughs> Second point, the uh, subject in uh, being an event is a purely positive concept defined by fidelity to the event and so on. But uh, it's clear that, for example, active negation of the neutrals is also subjective. So, we must define negative forms of subjectivity too. And it's a task of the beginning of the logic of the world to define three types of subjectivity, active, conservative, and reactive, something like that. Process, positive process of the truth, the refusal of the truth, but, uh, without any active intention, but the reactive subject, which uh, is in the possibility to be opposed, actively opposed to the truth. And uh, uh, the third technical uh, problem is that we have, from the 60s, 70s, a big discussion concerning uh, the, what is fundamental in mathematics. Uh, in mathematical discussion, right? not a philosophical one. Because we have two possibilities to use theory of sense, but also to use theory of categories. And theory of categories is very different. So some mathematicians have said to me, okay, you are an old, uh, you think of something which is old, <coughs> which is a uh, 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 good old sense. But uh, today what is really significant is the serial categories, which is much more general. I have also uh, a 
Δεν μα είναι Είναι λογική που ζούμε. Το λογική που ζούμε είναι το σεντ, είναι το φόβο, είναι το 